Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and today let's talk about Diane Setterfield. So, I thought today I would do an author spotlight on Diane Setterfield who is one of my favourite living authors, probably my favourite living author. She is a fantastic author, she's written three novels, all of which I've read, one of which came out this year and I've just finished reading which is what's prompted me to make this video now. So I've done a couple of other author spotlights on my favourite other contemporary authors in the past so I will link down below um, my video on Banana Yoshimoto, on Emily St. John Mandel and on John McGregor and there are a few other authors who I'm reading my way through all of their works at the moment who I would like to make a author spotlight video on in the future such as Kaz Ishiguro or Samantha Harvey or um, Sarah Waters. It will probably be a while before I can make one on Sarah Waters. I've got quite a lot left to go. I quickly want to talk about my like reading experience with Diane Setfield. As I said, she's published three novels, um, all of which were published fairly far apart. So her first novel, The Thirteenth Tale, I read as a teenager. I think I was about 14, 15, and I just completely fell in love with it. It remains my favourite contemporary novel. It remains my favourite novel that was not written in the 19th century. And like, if I were to write a list of my favourite books of all time, both modern and classic, um, it would still be in the top five. Um, I think it is absolutely incredible, and I love it a lot. Um, her second book, Bellman and Black, came out um, in 2013, I think. I read it at the time, I really enjoyed it, and then, as I said, her most recent book, Once Upon a River, just came out this year. I love her a lot. Um, as I said, The Thirdly Tale is my favourite like contemporary book, um, and her other two books are fantastic as well. I've also made a couple of videos in the past about The Thirteenth Tale, so I will link them down below. Um, I made a video well, I made a video which was a read-along announcement last September, but it was also like a reasons why you should read The Thirteenth Tale, so I will link that down below. That is spoiler-free, and I also made a spoilery discussion video about The Thirteenth Tale while I was doing the read-along that I hosted back in September. So I thought what I would do today, as I often do in these author spotlight videos, is first talk about some things that I like about Diane Setterfield's work in general, and then go through um, a little bit about those three books in order from my least favourite to my favourite, um, and why I like them. One thing that I love about her work is just her writing. She writes superbly. She has one of those writing styles that has a perfect balance between being beautiful and lyrical and detailed but also like never overdone, never getting in the way of her plot or her characterization. Although the writing is beautiful on its own, it's there as a tool to serve the story, um, which I love because I sometimes find when I read like more literary fiction, I sometimes find that the writing is so lyrical and beautiful that it gets in the way of everything else that's going on and Diane Setfield's writing is absolutely not like that. It is really like smooth and beautiful but also like precise and detailed and thought through and just yeah I love her writing a lot. It's fantastic. Another thing I think is wonderful about her books is the plotting, uh, especially the twists. Um, many of her books, especially The Thirty Tale, have great twists um, and her use of plotting and pacing in all three novels is really really fantastic. She's a very fantastic storyteller. Her novels also have a wonderful sense of atmosphere. I think all three of them are so atmospheric and you really really feel like you're there. Like her way of describing place and building atmosphere, not just about like the appearance of the place but the feel and kind of character of a place is so so good and so so strong. Another thing I love about her work is her characterization. Her characterization is superb and on point, especially like the complexities of slightly weird people. In all three books, um, it is absolutely superb. Thinking about Once Upon a River specifically, because I've just finished that um, and it's the most recent one I've read, there are so many characters in that and all of them, even the most minor ones, are like fully fledged and fully real people and they feel so thoroughly real and she's one of those writers who can just really get a full person in just a few sentences um, which is just so fantastic and something I really love. Another thing I really enjoy in her books is um, that they're infused with a real love of novels um, and of storytelling. Um, the Thirteenth Tale is very much a book about the love of books. One of the central characters has grown up in an antiquarian bookshop and the other one is a novelist and a lot of The Thirteenth Tale is about the love of books and storytelling. Um, and then in Once Upon a River, very interestingly, it's less about the written word, which The Thirteenth Tale is a lot about, but it's a lot about like oral storytelling and the book begins with like various people in a pub telling stories to each other um, and it's a lot about kind of the power of oral storytelling and storytelling traditions as they're kind of passed down through different people which is something I really really enjoy and think is really really fun and Bellman Black too is kind of infused with sort of folktale and fairy tale as well. Another thing that I love in her books is 
a real love of the 19th century and of Victorianness. Her work is really, really heavily inspired by the Victorian, especially the Victorian Gothic. So Bourbon and Black and Once Upon a River are both set in the Victorian period. Once Upon a River like explicitly says that it's set in the Victorian period. Bourbon and Black, I don't think it ever explicitly says, but it's very, very clear that it's set in the Victorian period. The 13th Tale is not set in the Victorian period. It's set over the course of the 20th century, probably, although the time in that is kind of ambiguous and floaty in a way that I love. Um, but the 13th Tale, that while that is not set in the Victorian period has a lot of references to Victorian literature and to the Victorian period. Margaret, the main character, loves Victorian novels. There's a lot of like Jada and Wuthering Heights references throughout all three of her books. Um, the two that are set in the Victorian period and the one that isn't are all like heavily influenced by the Victorian period and by Victorian literature, which of course as someone who loves Victorian literature is something that I love. Another thing that I really love about Diane Setfield is that she writes historical fiction that may or may not be supernatural. I'm actually going to make a video soon about historical fiction that may or may not be supernatural because it's, it's something I've realised I really love as a trope in historical fiction is when a historical fiction novel is historical and historically accurate but has an element which may or may not be supernatural and which by the end of the book you know and sometimes it's not supernatural which is possibly my favourite and sometimes it is supernatural which I also sometimes really like um, and Diane Setfield is definitely one of those writers where all of her works have a slightly like supernatural over or undertone um, and when she writes historical fiction that feels supernatural and sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't and sometimes it clearly is and sometimes it clearly isn't and sometimes it's very ambiguous and there's many ways to explain it which is something I just really really enjoy. Bellman and Black um, says on the front of it that it is like its subtitle is a ghost story and in the 30th tale it's a story within a story and one of the characters says to another I'm going to tell you a ghost story and then like in Once Upon a River there is a very important ghost story within it. Like she's an author who writes ghost stories that aren't quite ghost stories which is really really cool and she also kind of writes like fairy tales that aren't quite fairy tales. I feel like fairy tales Tales, ghost stories and Victorian gothic literature are all like really influential on her books which is something I just really really love. Another thing I love about her books is um, the themes in them. I think a few really important themes across all three of the books is kind of family and makeshift families I suppose and um, also books and storytelling as I said and death and grief are definitely very important in her works as well. Growing up and kind of childhood is quite important um, in all three books as well. They all deal with really really interesting themes at the forefront but they also have a lot of really interesting themes in the background and a lot of really complicated important things that are dealt with that are minor but are still there and are important for being there. For example one of the servants who works in the house in the 30th tale has dementia and it's not a huge part of the novel but it's really important and it's really well explored and in the Once Upon a River there is a character a boy called Jonathan who I think has Down syndrome and um, because it's set in the Victorian period that's not stated but that's how it reads to me. That aspect is really interesting too and Once Upon a River also looks again in the background at Victorian racism. One of the main characters is black and he is married to a white woman and they have many children together and the kind of way society views him that's really interestingly explored as well. I like the themes at the forefront of her books are really powerful but also the themes um, and interesting issues that are explored in the background of her books are so well done and so fantastic too. Another thing I love about Diane Setfield's novels um, which is something I've spoke about before in terms of her writing and also lots of Victorian authors that I love and also Emily St. Mandel as well is what I like to call the balance and what I mean by that is Diane Setfield is one of those writers again like Emily St. Mandel who balances great themes, brilliant characterization, elegant writing and a really brilliant pacey plot because I do find sometimes with contemporary fiction that the books that have the writing I love don't have as much plot as I would like in a book um, and Diane Setfield like Emily St. Mandel who I've spoken about before has a lot of plot um, and I love that there's a lot going on in these books and I think that's fantastic as well as all of the wonderful characterization themes and writing. And finally which is a very personal thing to me is and I've spoken about before in terms of The 30th Tale Diane Setfield is one of those authors that when I read her books I really just want to write um, because they're so brilliant and I find her such an inspiring writer and I find her books like so very much the kind of thing I really love therefore the kind of thing I'd really love to write and so whenever I read her books I'm like oh I want to write something like this so badly and um, which is what like I remember feeling like that about the 30th tale when I read it for the first time as a teenager and reading Once Upon a River um, last week really gave me that feeling as well so yeah those are just a few reasons why I love Diane Setfield very much now let's talk about her three books I'm gonna go from my least favorite to my favorite because that's what I always do in these videos but do bear in mind like these are all brilliant fantastic books these are all five star reads for me so Bourbon and Black is Diane Setfield's second novel. As I said, the subtitle is A Ghost Story. Let me read you the first few sentences. I have heard it said by those that cannot possibly know that in the final moments of a man's existence he sees his whole life pass before his eyes. 
If that were so, a cynic might assume William Belmont's last moments to have been spent contemplating anew the lengthy series of calculations, contracts and business deals that were made up his existence. In fact, as he approached the border with that other place, the border towards which we will all find our path turning sooner or later, his thoughts were drawn to those who had already crossed into that unknown territory. His wife, three of his children, his uncle, cousin and some childhood friends. Having remembered these lost dear ones and being still some moments from death, there was time for one last act of remembrance. What he unearthed after it had lain buried some 40 years in the archaeology of his mind was a rook. Let me explain. Like, even even just reading the first paragraph gives me shivers. We follow a man called William Bellman, and it's kind of about his relationship with death. As a child, he hits a rook with a catapult, um, and that's the kind of first time that he has any connection or relationship to death. And we follow William Bellman through his life, from his childhood into his adulthood. One evening in a graveyard, he meets a shadowy figure, a man called Black, who may or may not be real. And he makes a business deal with him and goes into production to create a kind of funeral industry, like a huge shop selling morning wear and funeral things, building into Victorian ideas and kind of culture and traditions surrounding death. I I love this book a lot. I really, really would like to reread it. It's been six years since I read this. I read it just when it first came out. Um, and I think when I first read it, I kind of wanted it to just be the 13th tale again. And it's very different. Um, and I love it a lot. And I think it's a very fantastic book in its own right. Definitely one I would recommend and definitely one I would like to reread. In fact, I was thinking, as last September I did a read-long of The Thirteenth Tale, maybe this September I could do a read-long of Bellman Black. So do let me know down in the comments if you'd be interested in that, and if people are, or even to be honest, if not very many of you are, I want to reread it anyway and may as well open it up. I will probably host a read-long of Bellman Black in September this year. And then maybe I'll do a read-long of Once Upon a River in September 2020, when it will have been a year and a half since I read it for the first time. I just really want to reread this because I know I loved it when I first read it, but I know I didn't love it as much as The Thirteenth Tale, and I think I probably didn't love it as much as I would on a second reading because I would kind of wanted it to be The Thirteenth Tale, which I think I probably got over by now. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to reread this, um, and maybe this September I will. Next, Once Upon a River. This is her most recent book, which has just come out in January of this year, and it is incredible, and I loved it a lot. I think this may be my favourite book of the year, possibly tied with the one by Emma Donoghue which I made a review of last week and I was considering making an individual book review of this but I also wanted to make a kind of Dying Zetterfield spotlight in general so I thought I would put these into one instead. Let me read you the first couple of sentences. There was once an inn that sat peacefully on the bank of the Thames at Radcott, a long day's walk from the source. There were a great many inns along the upper reaches of the Thames in the time of this story and you could get drunk in all of them but beyond the usual ale and cider each one had some particular pleasure to offer. The Red Lion at Kelmsnet was music, bargemen played their fiddles in the evening, and cheesemakers sang plaintantly of lost love. Inglesham had the Green Dragon, a tobacco-scented haven of contemplation. If you were a gambling man, the stag at Eton Hastings was the place for you, and if you preferred brawling, there was nowhere better than the plough just outside of Buscot. The Swan at Radcot had its own specialism. It was where you went for storytelling. So Once Upon a River opens at an inn on the Thames, where people are telling stories, and suddenly they find themselves in the middle of a story when an injured man runs in to the pub through the open door carrying a dead child in his arms. He faints, he's very very injured and they call the nurse to examine him. The nurse kind of helps to patch him up and examines the dead child who is definitely dead except when a few moments later she starts to breathe and open her eyes. And the book kind of goes on from there, um, following the man and the child and the nurse and the woman who runs the pub and various other characters pulling together a lot of different characters who live up and down the river. And various characters kind of lay claim to this little girl um, who seems to have come back from the dead. Um, she's four years old, she doesn't speak a word, and various people claim that she is their child, various people wish she was their child, um, and it's kind of about the influence this girl exerts and, and various people trying to kind of solve who she is and about the influence um, that this has on all the people who are living up and down the river. It is really beautiful. Um, aside from all the things I love about Diane Sedfield, which I've said before, this is just masterfully crafted and there are so many characters, all the characters are so interesting and so like tightly woven together. I love like the structure of this book and how it 
weaves all these characters together and there are so many really powerful wonderful characters in here that I loved a lot this is a truly fantastic book really exciting I'm looking forward to rereading it in the future I also read this in one day in one sitting which was really lovely it was really like it's not that short but um, I was on holiday and it was really nice to be able to properly dedicate that time to it so this came out in January like I said and the reason why it took me till April to read it even though I pre-ordered it literally a year ago um it was because I was so desperate to like give it its proper time which I did and I'm glad I did and it was fantastic and lovely and amazing so yeah this is very good it's very very good but for me few books are ever going to beat the 13th tale so Marissa from Blatantly Bookish also read Once Upon a River recently and I'll link her wrap up where she reviewed it below and she said that for her like Once Upon a River was definitely a five star book but the 13th tale is a six star book and I think I do have to agree with her not that like I don't necessarily think the 13th tale is a better book than Once Upon a River I just feel like the 13th tale has a true hold on my heart and um, that will never be released um and also it has like all of the tropes that I love in books um, and like all of the things it has an unreliable narrator and a story within a story um, and I haven't even explained what it's about yet I'll read you the first paragraph it was November although it was not yet late the sky was dark when I turned into lawn dress passage father had finished for the day switched off the shop lights and closed the shutters but so I would not come home to darkness he had left the light on over the stairs to the flat through the glass in the door it cast a fool's cap rectangle of paleness onto the wet pavement and it was while I was standing in that rectangle about to turn my key in the door that I first saw the letter another white rectangle it was on the fifth step from the bottom where I couldn't miss it so the 13th tale um follows a young woman called Margaret who has grown up in an antiquarian bookshop which her father runs and one day she receives a letter from a famous author called Vida Winter saying that she wants to tell Margaret Lee the story of her life um, and so Margaret goes to see Vida to be a, her biographer and Vida Winter is this mysterious figure who never tells anyone the truth about her life and who no one knows anything about but she decides to tell the truth to Margaret and she says to Margaret I'm going to tell you a ghost story and she begins to tell Margaret the story of a house called Angelfield and two mysterious twins, Adeline and Emmeline, who lived there um, and who were a bit weird, and many other things go on from there. It is beautiful and lyrical, full, as I said, with an absolute love of books, and just so perfect like I said it has everything that I love in books it has a big grand house it has like interesting historical elements it has exploration of family relationships it has a story within a story it's full of books and writers and weird children and governesses and just like everything that I could want in a book and it also has the best twist in any book that has ever been written and I love it a lot and I can't recommend it enough it is truly amazing. So those are Diane Setfield's three amazing novels. I've read The Thirteenth Tale three times and I've read the other two once, though like I said I would really like to reread Belmont and Black. I'm definitely thinking of doing a read-along this September and then maybe we'll do a Once Upon a River read-along the following year which could be really fun as well. So I think that's all I wanted to say today. I love Diane Setfield a lot. Please let me know if you like Diane Setfield a lot, if you've read any of her novels or especially if you've read The Thirteenth Tale but not read any of her other work. Are you interested in picking up her other two books now because I promise they are really, really Really fantastic as well. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for watching today and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.